<laughs> the number one thing that we look for in founders that we want to back is that they're in a mad rush. <laughs> in a mad rush to fix something. And Philip on the stage with me here today is the very definition of what that means. From the very first minute when I met Philip, it was very clear that you're in a mad rush to fix climate. So what does that mean? Uh, 1,5 in 2023 was the fastest growing company in Europe. You reached a unicorn status in less than two years. If that's not a mad rush, then I don't know what really is. So, but first things first, I'd love to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about you? Who, who are you and what led you to start 1,5? I'm Philip, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm 40 years old. I'm a uh, father of a daughter and the second one is coming. So um, there's also family life, yeah, um, in that rush. Um, I have spent my career since 2005, 6, um, as a startup entrepreneur in energy. I did a lot of things. Some went well, others didn't. <laughs> um, uh, I think the most interesting parts of the career that people can relate to is uh, um, I had the privilege of building Tesla in Germany for the Model S arrival. So very early when electric cars were like a pain and nobody wanted to have them and they were really unsexy. Um, before Elon and Tesla was really a brand that everybody adored. Um, uh, so that was a really, um, let's say, a time that has taught me a lot. Um, and another uh, company that also taught me a lot was Zonen. I was one of the managing directors and also a very early shareholder of Zonen, which is, was one of the first battery companies that focused on solar plus batteries. So basically generate your own electricity and then store it and get independent of the grid. Um, we scaled that company in Europe, United States and also in Australia and it was sold at some point to Shell. Um, and around in, in, in this, you know, in this ecosystem, I met a lot of great people um, uh, and they are also now part of our journey at 1,5. Amazing. So for those who don't know 1,5, can you tell us a little bit more about 1,5 specifically? What is it that you do? 1,5 is, is, I think, it really started as a, as a session in a, in a basement with three people I really like a lot and whose opinion I value. Um, my co-founders, so I asked them to co-found 1,5 and we came up, like we have all been frustrated, we've worked together before at Tesla, at Zonan, in, in different stages of, of, of our careers, so we know each other, also the battling times when you are stressed and in a rush. Um, so, but we were sitting down and said, okay, like what, what, what do we really need um, in Europe when it comes to clean tech? And we did clean tech before and a couple of things that came to mind for us. The first one is, um, uh, we, 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 we look at a scenario where we say, what do we have to do to have an impact on climate? The problem with if you are working in clean tech, you're always behind. You're always, you're, it's like a battle you cannot really win. Like you, every year you look at the data and every year you hear the speech, speeches and nothing really happens. That's how you feel. And we said, okay, let's make a plan where we believe that we can make a difference. Um, and we didn't know that we were going to raise a lot of money then. We were aiming for it, but the plan was simple. We said, okay, we need to be fast because 1,5 is, is the name of the CO2 target of the uh, Paris Climate Accord. So we need to be really fast. We need to have a lot of impact. So what do we do? The first thing that we came uh, to is we said, installation of heat pumps, charge points, uh, solar systems are a pain. People still hate it, it's not sexy, it's not convenient, it has not been revolutionized. So we said we need to, do, we need to build a workbench, a global one, um, that can scale really fast. And we said, okay, if we want to do this, we believe the best way of doing it is inviting entrepreneurs to the table who are already electricians, installers today, who are focusing on these assets. So we said, okay, if we do that, we could potentially scale through lots of markets very fast. Um, aggregate procurement power, put a new brand on it, and have the platform that we need. And the, the second point is, we said, okay, this, this would be the right to sit on the table, to actually participate in this race. The second point was, we wanted to innovate the way how you create such a system. So a one-stop shop for all of these systems. This, this includes logis logistics, software, um, but you also map the processes of every th single move 
of the carpenter, of the electrician, of the roofer, of the plumber, and has, has not been done before. So we, we are, we're, that's the second thing. We, we are back in the basement saying, like, what, what do you want to do? And we said, if we get the money, we'll try to reinvent that because nobody cares about it. Everybody cares about the product, the hardware product, um, or maybe a software layer, but nobody really wants to do the mass fulfillment. And there's a lot of cost to be saved. And that was the second point. And the third point, we said, if we get those entrepreneurs on the platform and scale like crazy, and then we reinvent the software layer, which is basically a CRM and an operating system for all of the things that we have to deliver, and let's assume that we make it, we will create problems in the grid. So we know from our expertise that if you scale solar, you create problems also. You have peak, mm. you have off-peak. You know, if there's no sun, there's no electricity. If there's no wind, there is no, there is no electricity. And we always, we've always worked at Zonnet at VPPs before, and we said, okay, we need to connect all these assets to a platform that truly can change the en energy market in a way where consumption follows production. The problem today is um, that we simply consume whenever we want. And solar and wind are cheap, even free, I would argue, at some point, if they are written off, the generators, but they are not available all the time. So we basically came up with the idea, and the concept is a bit older, we've, we've invested time in that before, um, to have a software that matches consumption, electric car, heat pump, AC, they don't consume all the time. They just you know, go over time. Um, and connect this with the production on the production side. Like if there's lots of wind, you get free electricity essentially um, uh, in order to create a system that be can become sustainable and working because right now there are more problems. And now you already, I mean, you believed in us, but if we pitch <laughs> something like this to an investor, they will tell you, okay, go back, smoke pot. Yeah? Um, yeah. But um, uh, 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 this, is, this is the company we created and now we have uh, 1,800 employees. 500 million euros in revenue this year. We are profitable. We'll make about 45 million euros in profits this year. Um, we have created that software layer and we have connected also the VPP, so we are rushing, yeah. yeah. You're definitely, definitely rushing. And one thing that I love about it is whenever you talk about clean energy, we sort of think about these leapfrog innovations. What I really loved about 1,5 is that, you know, first solar panel was inv invented in 1880. I mean, that's crazy. And it's literally taken a century to get it to a point where you can really roll it out to the masses. So it's really the innovation alone is not enough. You need to innovate and then you need to roll it out really quickly in a mad rush that you're doing that. But maybe then about kind of the scaling journey, um, you know, working with founders, I think I'm yet to hear and meet a founder who, who tells me that, hey, you know, scaling my company was walk in the park. I mean, it's never walk in the park. That's the bar. And then there is the 1,5 bar, as you said, going from three founders in a garage to 1,500 employees in like two years. That's insane. How do you do that? And, and what have been some of the war stories along the way? <laughs> I, I think the very honest answer to that is it is only possible because we have a team that has failed together before in other companies. So we have a broader team of a couple of dozen people. Um, we have worked together before. Some of these With how many of the people have you worked? So it's the three founders who've worked together and still large share of the management team. I made a habit out of trying to take great or convince great talent to rejoin. So at Tesla, we took about a dozen people from Tesla to Zonnen. Um, from Zonnen, we talk, took more than a dozen people on various layers, also back to 1,5. And the same goes for, for Tesla and for, for other companies that we are close with. So I think without that muscle memory and the failures of the past, it would have been impossible. Yeah? And, uh, uh, and I think we are profiting from that. And I think we are also in a unique position and timing is also key. I mean, yes, we are working really hard and I think we are probably one of the best teams in Europe for, for, for the purpose of what we're doing. However, also timing and topic fit totally. So I, I would say for me, this is probably the, I think it's not going to reappear in my career ever to, to be in this position. And so it adds also a level of um, responsibility and also appreciation that this probably won't happen again. It's, 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 we are in a, at a perfect spot, in a perfect time with the right team. Um, and that's the only reason why we came this far. Um, and yeah, so and now it's more like a burden because, I mean, obviously we ask for a lot of money. We have promised a lot to shareholders. We, have, we are promising a lot to talent. Um, and, and to customers, especially to customers. Um, the, the claim to live on wind and sunlight forever for free, we are backing that with a performance warranty in Sweden. So they yeah. will have a zero um, kilowatt hour bill. 
And in Germany, we're also doing something similar. So, so I think right now we are, we are uh, super focused and, and, and uh, aware of the responsibility to execute and deliver. Yeah. And I also want to talk a little bit more about kind of the market in general and, and kind of the future of energy. And back to what I was mentioning previously, there is kind of two schools of thoughts. One school of thought, thought says that, you know, we still need leapfrog innovations to still get to the net zero dark, uh, targets. And the other school of thought says that, no, actually, we already have enough innovation. The next step is about incremental improvements. Let's bring down cost, increase efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Which school of, school of thought do you belong to? We still need leapfrog innovations or can we get there with what we have invented already today? I think the one problem about climate change is it invites opinion and it invites smart people to uh, think of complex philosophies. Uh, we believe at 1,5 we can only change what is within our own hands. So we, we would rather, and that's also something when we have discussions with developers, we have now 150 software developers. Um, the, the discussion is always like we focus on what we can do. Also, 1,5 as a, as a company name um, is about what can we do, what can every individual do that is owning a home, is owning a building. So if you start talking about philosophy um, and start reading Nietzsche, yeah, you, I think it's time to, it's, it, it would frustrate me way too much. So my school of thought is let's focus on what we can do and let's go step by step to Im increase the impact that we have. Um, so, so I would say it will need a, a lot more than we can give for, uh, for the 1.5 degree target and also for that tipping point. I also think that human race will only learn when we really feel much more pain. It's just the way it is. Um, and I think there is enough room for plenty of companies and technologies in that field. Um, but I would focus every founder and maybe also investor to, we, ha we don't have time, so let's focus on what we can do right now. Um, and that's, I think, also what you meant with incremental. There's a lot of things we can do right now. We don't need to discuss about China. We can, you know, I can make sure that my home is CO2 neutral. And I can live CO2 neutral, uh, neutral in heating and mobility um, in, in electricity. I can save money, actually, on it. So let's do that. And that's what we're focusing on. Yeah. And of course, you're already on your way to make a dent in the world. What do you think are other kind of low-hanging fruits that aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience, you know, if, if, if they are thinking about the business to start that could help us navigate the energy transition. What are the other low-hanging fruits that someone just needs to take and, and execute? To be honest, if you, are, if you really want to become an entrepreneur, um, or uh, if you really want to do that, first thing you need to realize, there is no low-hanging fruit. <laughs> and then, then you need to really check in with how hard you really want it. You pay a price for it. The price that the team pays um, in lifetime that we allocate is brutal. I think Slush and also other events, they kind of they, they have a proposition of how it is to be an entrepreneur. I think most entrepreneurs who have been living through that, they like to be here at Slush, me as well, and, you know, because everybody's like, wow, yeah, I want to be like you. But <laughs> to be honest, in, you pay a price for that and you have opportunity cost. And, and you what need to makes it worth it for you? I think I'm addicted to, to self-impact. There are two things. If you, can, if, you, if you understand that you can change things, and then you get addicted to the idea how far you can go. So you do something and it happens. And you do another thing and it also happens. You, you, you of course, get amazed by the potential and the impact that you have. But the more, more interesting thing is to have this as a group feeling. If you elevate great talent around you and they get amazed about this as well. So you can really see how they, like she, Yannick, our chief product officer, he was a working student at Tesla, um, driving out cars and driving back cars. He studied journalism, <laughs> so he came from a completely different place. But to, to, to elevate the entire team and to share this feeling mm. is for, for me the, the true purpose and also the true connection that makes it worthwhile. Because um, it, that, that's amazing, yeah? and it's also dangerous because it's highly addictive, yeah. but it's also fun and makes it absolutely worth it, um, uh, but still you have to really want it. Yeah. And if you don't really want it, don't do it. <laughs> and, and it's like there is a lot of stories out there in the market about kind of Tesla and, and the culture and also kind of the mad rush culture. How, how many things have you borrowed from that culture that you are now Im implementing in, in the 1,5 journey? 
I, I would say that the Tesla culture that I saw, and I mean I'm out now for a couple of years, um, has been a marketing fake to young talent. So you tell people you need to come work for this company and at a very low income because it's cool and you can go anywhere later. And it did work really well. So at Tesla, we did this all the time. We hired, we didn't hire only students we hired for, for sales, for example. Yeah. Um, but I think what Tesla didn't do and what I also disconnected me from, from the vibe was um, it didn't elevate people sustainably. Um, and there was also not, it was more like it, it had the vibe to push you up, but at some point um, there was no sustainability in the relationships to the, of the leadership teams as well. And that, that for me was not a place where I would think that I would l spend my professional lifetime. So um, I think you can learn a lot about Tesla. They are super, especially Elon is 100% um, fundamentalist about what you need to do. If you, if you recognize you need to do something um, and startups or founders, they, 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 they know they need to do this, but then they say, but I don't have the means for it, so I aim here. You, you'll fail immediately. So what you can learn from Tesla is just aim exactly at what you need to move. And it might sound ridiculous if you, you know, tell it someone at the first time, but never, ever, ever, ever start aiming lower because the, 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 uh, you might not get the funding, whatever, but if you lower the aim, you may, uh, might, might end up with a company that doesn't really have an impact, right? So, and yeah. that kind of, that school of thought to be super clear in your master plan and super clear of what you need to really change, um, I think that you can learn from Tesla and be brutal about it. Yeah. And for the record, as, a, as an investor, usually we get the business plan from founders and then, you know, what you always do is you haircut it by 20, 30 percent because you kind of see that analogy that, you know, these are the targets, you know, you should shoot for the stars, but then realistically we know that that's not going to be possible. And I just wanted to share here that I think you're one of the few founders that beats even your own really, really ambitious business plan, which, which is, which I think but again that's, that's goes back second, to the mad rush. That's the second <laughs> entrepreneur mistake. Always a budget is a, is a promise to your shareholder. That's it. And you need to be on a level where you don't need, need to outsell them. Like, we had these questions many times from investors. They're like, okay, this is the business plan, so what do you think is realistic? So, what the fuck? Are you not taking me, I'm, you're not taking me seriously. And it's also <laughs> not, the, it's not the kind of relationship I want to have with shareholders. The relationship I want to have with shareholders is I will tell you what I think. And I will tell you what, what my and our problems are. Um, and if you, if you fuck that up from the beginning, again, it's a big mistake. Don't do it. Your budget, at least, there are always problems and external risk. But at least you should draft a budget in a way that you see it's a shareholder uh, promise and you build trust with your shareholders if you do what you say. And so, so, so we will always try, we will continue to try to, yeah. to surprise you positively. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Doesn't happen that often that you're surprised on the upside, but you somehow keep, keep, keep managing to do that. And then also going back to the markets a little bit more, like day to day, like what's your biggest frustration? I mean, I think no one chooses climate change. Like any person in the room here is obviously against that, but somehow we're sleepwalking into it and it somehow seems that business regulatory framework is just not adapting oh, fast enough. And when you look at the world, what just kind of like really frustrates you? I mean, this makes no sense. Why are politicians what, what, what not I'm, acting? What I'm frustrated with is the lack of innovation um, on that level because it's only one word, it's convenience. It's, it's like, like, you know, in Germany we have a right-wing party called AfD, yeah, so they say climate change is not real. I want that these people still buy my product because it's better, it's cheaper and better, it's more convenient. So I think if, if you have to start to make the argument, if, if you have to put, it's cool for branding to put purpose into, into it, but I think from a product perspective, we are not having smartphones because somebody told us it's wise to do it or morally right. We never do what's morally right. Yeah, I mean, no. maybe sometimes. <laughs> but um, so, so, so I think it's, it's very simple. I mean, you, you need to create a product where every uh, climate change denier will still take it because it's just so much better. You and just have to make it easy. Uh, exactly. So it, 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 the convenience of installation, the one-stop shop, but also the prop proposition of the benefit. Like, um, we, we are cutting costs so deep and so hard for the customer. Um, and yes, we love that there are many customers backing us on CO2 and the climate change, but for lasting impact, I have to decouple the benefit from ideology. 
if you, if you want to, we don't want to discuss ideology. We want to have a product that is so powerful that people will simply change because it, out of its own value, it makes sense. So in the end of the day, we're our own worst enemies that uh, you really only decarbonize your home if it's cheaper than your yes. existing energy yes, bill. Yes, especially if you look at other, you know, if you look at, uh, at, at non-EU, US um, countries, I mean, they will not have the kind of la uh, policy support behind this. So yes, absolutely. And, and we also think that capitalism is a tool in, 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 mm. in fighting climate change. I don't need to agree with principles of capitalism as a human being, but I think the, 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 the change maker, the, the only change maker I have met <laughs> in my lifetime is, is capitalism. They, capitalism has the potential to change and accelerate change dramatically. And, and, and we hope that we are that there's going to be a, a tipping point on that when, when the benefit uh, is, is hitting in, um, where people simply will only book these kind of services. Yeah? And, and that's, what we are, that, that's what we are building on. So we want people to simply choose um, our product and service. Um, and speaking of capitalism, like I also know that you've chosen your investors very, very carefully. Like I have heard you say many, many times that I want mission-aligned investors. I want investors that understand what we're doing. Why is that important to you? If, you had, if you've been involved in venture capital firms before, um, you, you tend as an entrepreneur to select brand. So you're a bit like, okay, there's a big brand and they tell you that they're super cool and then you uh, invite a shareholder to the table. It's a bit like, it's such an important relationship, especially if it doesn't go well. So I've been at the point with teams where we didn't select investors right. And the wrong set of investors, board members, observers, people that you spend a lot of time with and that you're also, that have some power over you, I rather don't do around or, you know, be limited on scale than inviting the wrong people into the family um, uh, because it really, once you start discussing non-issues, once you have politics in the board or on the shareholder mm -hmm. side, you decrease the probability of success entirely, you demotivate top C-level staff that have exposure to shareholders, so we really try to make sure to not do that. And, um, and we are very frank, if we think shareholders don't understand, we tell them as well. I mean, shareholders uh, investors tell um, founders all the time that they have decided not to invest. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, money is a commodity. Yeah? Um, talent yeah. isn't. No, it's crazy. It's like I've, uh, I'll, uh, myself as a climate investor, that we all understand the need to invest in climate, but at the same time there is a talk a little bit of a climate bubble that's, that's kind of putting off some more generalist investors. Uh, do you encounter that as well, where some investors say, hey, I'm not, even though there is a solution, fantastic track record, I'm not going to invest because there is a bubble and I'm just going to close my eyes on, on the bigger problem? I would say there is already a bubble in, in climate tech because the problem is that you have um, e-commerce venture capitalists that understood that their LPs want to invest in something like that, so they follow the taste of the LP without having the experience or the knowledge to actually understand a, a physical market is much more physical, hardware related, infrastructure related, regulatory related, um, and they just follow that trend. And I think that's opportunistic, but it's okay. Uh, um, I think it, it will be hard for them to really make good choices um, because it's diff different. We are profiting now from that trend, and I think that's good. Um, obviously, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but we, I think it's really good because I've been in a company called Zonen when there was no clean tech money available. Mm. So um, uh, I think there is still um, room to make and I think also there will be venture capital funds that, that um, have that experience already and that create that kind of experience and will facilitate um, successful companies and there are going to be some that won't, yeah. which is fine. Amazing, I think that our time is also almost up and I always like to wrap up with a call to action. You can choose what that call to action is, be it to the investors in the room, to the founders in the room and everyone in between. But if there is one call to action that you can make, what would that be? Mm, I think the most, I think the, the, and it doesn't matter whether you're an investor, an entrepreneur, a manager, if you are a human being and you, <laughs> you, you, ha you want and have to work for your uh, income, you will invest your lifetime, uh, your awake lifetime, 80% of your, the time that you are awake, or maybe 75% or 70 or 90, whatever, um, into your career. And I think, um, what, what, what I think the choice that you all can make is if you think 
first of all, you need to select a topic that you really um, love. I mean, everybody's saying that. When, when we look at climate change, I would ask to, if you really pretend to care, look whether you are generating the biggest impact with your talent. Because talent is a, is a very, is an indicator, if you pool it, that can change the probability of a future scenario. So if, if, the, this, if the top talent is leaving big fossil companies, if the top talent is leaving investment companies that are not focusing on what's right, if uh, the talent is, is leaving even a company like Google or Facebook, whatever, to dedicate their lifetime and their talent and, uh, and, and, and time into this topic, the probability of success will increase. So I would ask everybody to just double check whether you are investing your lifetime in the most meaningful way. Wow, that's a big call to action. We only live 29,000 days, give or take, at least that's what I read, so call to action, make it count. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. <laughs>